Well, it's a lot of noise. It can now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Talk a bit louder. Well, it's never else to stop talking. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so thank you to uh, you as well as, as CIO, CCIO Network for inviting us along to talk um, to you as well. I'm going to uh, come on you into Brave and say I, uh, I'm from Nets and I'm here to help. Um, you can uh, make the badges for that. Um, effectively, what we've done, uh, a little bit of background, is we use NHS England to program around open source. We started Probably a year ago, when we went out to the US and looked at VISTA, the uh, VA Veterans Administration System there, somebody uh, mentioned it a little bit earlier, and we were looking at it as a product, a potential product for the NHS. And in looking at it, we were sort of taken by the absolute clinical ownership that was built into the system. We spoke to any of the clinicians that used it. It was absolutely obvious that they used it because it was meaningful. It would take a build example earlier correlation between use and usability. That was the sort of thing that they were absolutely um, putting at the top of their priority list. Make it usable for us and we will use it. Um, but aside from that, um, Vista has got some challenges in the fact that it's quite a, a complex product. It's been built in many ways. Um, we were talking earlier about the fact that it was distributed across multiple settings and how do you bring that back together and manage that. So we looked at it and, and our ultimate decision was that there's a place for Vista in, in the UK market, but actually we don't want to set our sites just at that level. And we also don't want to be accused of almost like another national program for IT and bringing an open source product and saying this is the answer, now everybody go and install it. So we came back with a, a sort of a conversation to be had with everybody who's involved in open source and, and the EPR market in the NHS and look at what we could do differently. How could we bring or support open source in a more general basis because we thought that there was a bigger market for it than just to sort of talk about one thing or another. I'll talk a little bit about the details in a moment, but it, it led to us running a program where we wanted to tackle open source and see what we could support. And I'm really pleased to say that you know, today we've got quite a strong representation from the community of open source. Um, I don't want to be insulting and say enthusiasm. I've said it, but I didn't mean to. Um, but um, the, those people are here as well as the sort of clinical community as well. So it'd be difficult for me to pitch some of this conversation because I've, I've tried to take it as a basic open source level and the people who perhaps have a different perception of, of some of the definitions, but I'm trying to pitch it so that everybody can come to understand it. I think one of the other key things in terms of the introduction was just talking about the involvement of, of Bill and, and people like him. Um, there are a few clinicians in the room who are actively involved in, in pushing this agenda forward. And I don't think it's always appreciated the fact that you know technology is really just a facilitator of achieving the end outcome. I mean, through as a pyramid, ultimately the patients at the top of the pyramid. And as, as we go down the stack, we'll see that that goes through to clinicians and then all the way down through to technology, through to bits of wire like you all saw in, in the data center earlier. Now, technology is becoming far more commoditized, and you see that the value of the technologists is stepping up that pyramid to the point that they can engage and they can talk about applications and services and, and functions that are meaningful to the clinicians that use it. But really importantly, the clinicians, the users in, in any other industry are the ones stepping down the pyramid and engaging with technology. So it's somewhat embarrassing when you know, a, a clinician, an ophthalmologist, probably knows more about IT and open source than they do. Um, but I'll take you through some slides, talk a little bit about the, the detail of what we're doing, where we're going, and how that relates to the tech fund that was launched a couple of days ago, and what we want to try and achieve, how we're here to support you. So in terms of what open source is, um, as I say, there are different definitions. They're all around an ethos, and I'm trying to describe an ethos here rather than a very specific technical service that you would see otherwise or a contract. It's based on trying to improve software, collaborate around that through open innovation. It's fundamentally successful when it's driven by those people who have a desire to use it and improve the product. Bill's already mentioned around the, the red hat delivery model. You know, new business models come up around open source. So it, it isn't purely trying to extract <coughs> from the proprietary market and remove any sort of commercial possibilities around it. It's fundamentally underpinned by commercial opportunities. So this is a different model that I'll talk about. And the 
scale of openness to suit the needs. Um, there were some questions asked earlier around does the whole stack need to be open source for this to be open source? Well, no, it doesn't. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you don't mind the fact that you're using some commodity software that costs you fifty pounds a year to license, then why would that really put you off trying to achieve open source in a, in a clinical system where you can be talking about saving hundreds of thousands of pounds a year and, and getting all the benefits? So, yes, there's a there's a sort of um, as Bill said, there's, there's a sort of a nice image to be portrayed by us all using open source, and, it, and it's good in terms of selling that message, but it's not essential. And we can be open to, to different levels as well, both within the products. You know, we talked earlier a little bit about APIs, for those who, who sort of are, le are less technical. You know, APIs are, are the way we can interface between systems. So you can have an open source system interfacing to a proprietary system. And it's through open source and another number of initiatives that we're driving that openness, trying to create a more open ecosystem. Um, we're not against people using single vendor large um, proprietary systems in a hospital. If you, if you just delivered that as part of the national program, we certainly wouldn't be recommending that you need to go back there and remove it. But actually, there is a, an ecosystem building. We're seeing even those large system providers talk now about opening their APIs and engaging and, and adding on clinical specialties such as open eye to their product range because they realize that actually to be able to manage that and then also to be able to continuously improve and upgrade, you actually need to componentize it. You need to be able to think about it in different sections. So if you're not thinking about an entire change to your organization, your trust, when you want to change one component. At a slightly lower level in terms of open source, based on four freedoms, freedom to use the software how you want, freedom to redistribute the copies, freedom to understand how it works and adapt it, and free to make and share and free with anyone. Now that sounds very open, and I think what has to be clear to people is that if you're a trust without a, a very strong IT department, or historically haven't really had development teams in house, it doesn't mean that you can't participate in open source. It may well be that you're looking, and, and Bill talked about the Open Source Foundation, that's uh, the Open Eyes Foundation. You can look to other <coughs> organisations, you can manage that for you. And certainly what we want to do with NHS England is make sure that trusts who want to adopt and want to use open source do so in a safe way where they can you know, talk to their boards, talk to their non-exec directors about how we've removed the risk from doing so. So that's looking towards organisations, I'll talk a bit more about that in a second, that can act as a custodian, as a, a safe reference point for using these those products. So how can it be used in the NHS? I talked before about Vista and a large EPR. We've seen lots of examples of small open source products that have been developed. We've got clinical specialties such as Open Eye. And really, what I wanted to explain here is that this is a viable approach across a broad spectrum of systems and software. Um, I asked a question earlier, actually, around the not only the code, but configuration one, which is the fact that actually, in terms of trying to open up and, and collaborate and share, some of the <coughs> open source products we're looking at have a, a significant amount of intelligence built into the clinical workflows. And if one of the things we can do is actually share and open source that business logic, that in itself is a big achievement because you know, there's hours and hours of clinical thinking that go into actually defining some of those clinical workflows. And those can be shared either across systems or, or more generally into systems as well. But really, you know, open source, and, and we as NHS England are all supported across this broad spectrum. We sort of prioritised more in the EPR space initially because we see that as being where there can be a big bang for buck. But there is also a, a whole ecosystem building and that goes all the way down to the commodity software whether it's you know windows or open office or um, any of those sort of commodity pieces of software so why are we why are we supporting open source i mean as nhs england we're a commissioning organization not a delivery organization and i go back to the point i made at the start around facilitation that's part of our job is to facilitate a, a sort of vibrant successful market this is all underpinned by a general drive to digitize the NHS and increase its operability across care centers. So open source is one way to, to sort of challenge the current um, what to call it stale market, but you know it's a stagnant market, add some more competition, provide new opportunities, and fundamentally deliver some of these things. So principally this removes vendor lockdown. So product isn't necessarily a bad thing. You've chosen a product, you like it, your organization works with it. 
you don't necessarily want to be able to uh, move away from it. You, you perhaps want to keep that product. But you may be getting a really bad service from the company that implemented it, is supporting it, and, and perhaps not being reactive. Well, by being open source, you get that chance to, to separate the ownership of the product from the company that provides services to you. And that allows you then to make choices around who you want to develop the product, who you want to have support it, what direction you take that product if you decide whether or not you're part of the community, what you want to do as it moves forward. Increases responses to fixed and change requirements. This is all about how we can drive down the amount of time. There's numerous anecdotes as you speak to people who've worked in, in hospitals implementing some of these systems, they'll tell you of the pain and frustration of saying that they wanted a new piece of functionality, they wanted to change to something that was driven there that was bug to fix. And it would take 12 months for it to go through a cycle of, of requirements, gathering, development, testing, and deployment. And it's simply not good enough. We, as a, a group, when we were upstairs, we asked the question of the development team, if you've got an important change to make, how quickly can you get it out there? And they said, hours. You know, for people who've been working in some of these environments where it takes years, you know, that would be such a shift in terms of reactiveness and ability to actually deliver clinical value and change the way you work for them. They all talked about increasing the total cost of ownership. Well, we wouldn't want to get in at this stage to an argument about that because people who are uh, less passionate about open source or even outwardly you know, uh, resist it would argue the case of whether or not you can justify the total cost of ownership. We think that there is over a long period of time, and we're going to do some work there just in to try and demonstrate that through some benefits analysis. But fundamentally, it's not the principal driver for doing this. So if you're thinking that using open source is, is driven purely alone by saving money, that's not the right reason to be looking at open source. Um, it should drive down competitive pricing to support maintenance. By having the reduction in vendor locking, you should actually have choice in the market of who can provide those services, and that gives competition and allows small organisations to compete in a market that was probably dominated by large enterprises previously. Simulates wide participation. I mean, this is one of the fundamental keys. I'm not going to try and explain it as well as build it, but the participation of the clinicians from multiple different organisations is absolutely fundamental to how you drive the improvement in these products. This is how you can get the, the sort of gathered knowledge of years of clinical experience to actually make the product most suited to, to the needs of the actual clinician and, and ultimately the patient. Um, one sort of myth buster at the bottom um, on the technical level is, is that there's no reason why this isn't as safe and easy to manage as proprietary software. There's an almost a clear factor in, in some corners that because it's open source, you run the risk that you know, some teenager in his bedroom who's got access to the internet suddenly goes in, throws a few lines of code in there which is going to impact and suddenly make this better long for us. That isn't the way we're approaching this, certainly not the way that the open line team are or any of the organisations we're working with. This is a absolutely fundamental way to control the access to this, to ensure we manage the testing, the clinical testing, the technical testing as well, to ensure that we don't have any of those risks. We can control them and determine how much we want to open them. So at the moment, we'll see here are developing the code with some contributions from a couple of partner organisations. Over time, those contributions may be widened so you can start to get actual technical contributions from other trusts or other um, independent proprietary software providers. But you can control it, so it can all come through one point. Why open source in the NHS? Um, I talked already about the fact that we're trying to drive a digitisation. You know, it's fundamental to us achieving patient safety objectives, but also meeting the funding gap in terms of delivering good care. I've already made the point, you know, you don't need to have your, your team of developers there to, to actually use these products. It supports direct clinical engagement in product development, the usability and the amount of use as we've already seen directly from the <coughs> Sharing innovation across the NHS, again, it's coming back to the point that it's one of the only ways we're actually going to meet the funding gap over time by actually taking investment and taking it once and sharing it rather than actually having to do it multiple times. And it shares the best practice. Um, it will help us deliver improvements in, in technology. And 
how we use technology. And related to this program, and we didn't talk about it today, but we also want to talk a little bit about Code for Health. Um, it was launched by Tim Kelsey a year or so ago, and some people will be really in tune with it in terms of teaching clinicians to code, as it said, but we see it as more than that, and, and that's what we're developing now, which is, it's not just about taking those clinicians or, or any, anyone really involved in health to be able to actually sit down and write some of the lines of code. It's also about taking everybody from the person who's introduced effectively to manage to somehow evade using IT for the past 10, 15 years to the point where they, they'll happily sit at the computer and start using it. And those people who are that level taking them on to the point where they'll sit and talk to their IT department about what their needs are, to the ones who are in that point taking them on to the point where they'll sit down and they'll actually co-create products and work with the developer to say, okay, what is moving over here? And use the sort of forums that um, the open IT is using as well. So what are we doing as NHS England? Um, well, at events like today championing the use of it, I mean, we, we can't <coughs> take credit for the hard work and um, brilliant solutions that are being produced out there, not only by Bill's team, but by a number of others who are in the room today. We can help, hopefully, facilitate the adoption of this within the NHS. So, hopefully working with the procurement teams within Trust to, to help them better engage, to help them understand how to buy these products, provide the marketplace, help individual commercial, well, commercial organisations organisations that are trying to bring open source products to the NHS, help them access the market, facilitate introductions through the events that we've run today, to be one example, but we've, we've got a few <coughs> others on the 11th of June, we've got the event in London where we are doing a full open source day um, alongside the Health Insights Day. That's a real opportunity for trust to go and engage with the market and providers, look at what's on offer, and actually think about how feasibly they can go and take these products. Fundamentally, at the moment, that is driven by the tech funds application. So I'm sure most people will be aware of the money that's available for those sort of applications to the tech fund. It's really important we leverage that capital that's there and, and we've got a strong focus on open source all the way through the perspective for that. But it goes beyond that. It goes into the period <coughs> after that when it becomes a, a sort of steady operating state. And Beverly was here, she'd be you know, um, hoping that it goes successfully and telling you that then we're gonna go after tech fund three, four, five, six, seven. Now, whether or not that happens, we want to demonstrate that open source is, is still an absolutely fundamental part of our bigger picture plan of digitizing the NHS. Other things we're doing is around creating communities of interest. Open Eyes have already done that. You probably saw that in the development room upstairs. There are communities of interest from both the technical teams but also the clinical teams as well. It's our intention to progress that. We've got a website as a, as a starting point for community interest already. That's growing, the membership's growing. Obviously we've got the Twitter account that maybe some of you are already following. We're trying to generate that and then what we'll create is some specialty communities of interest around whether it's about clinical specialties particularly or whether it's about particular technical specialties or in time the, the specific products that are open source. Um, I've already mentioned about the tech funding. Um, already mentioned about engagement events. <coughs> Part of the community's interest will be around sharing innovation, best practice examples. Um, some of the work that was done interestingly in the, um, in the US was around how do they share code that has been built for um, municipal government. And the biggest value they could get from that was looking at ways of customizing existing code. So publishing it, making everyone aware of what code has been written. And one of the examples we learned about was they, somebody built a system that allowed you to identify all the different fire hydrants in, in Boston. When it snowed heavily, you could go and lay claim as a, as a member of the community to a particular fire hydrant and volunteer to be the person that goes and digs it out. Really successful, within hours, every single fire hydrant in the country, in the area, had been, um, had been claimed by somebody who would be responsible for doing it now. They then looked at that, and somebody in Hawaii, where you'd be pleased to know it doesn't snow and they don't have any fire hydrants to dig out, looked at the fact that they've got tsunami warnings, and they were able to lift that entire product and change the name from Boston to Hawaii, change fire hydrant to tsunami warning device, and deploy it within a matter of a few days. So people would lay claim to tsunami warning devices, because basically what was happening is people going 
Jerome and Stephen and Carl back into the project. So they, they had a sense of ownership. So very quickly, you can see how that sort of capability moves and creates a, a, a sort of uh, capability that's spread from people, you know, 12 hours distant from each other, given the ability to share code and share that sort of innovation very quickly before it. One of the, the fundamental underpinnings of how the delivery model for this open source is, is how do you create that sense of community? And I talked earlier around the fact that this can be all, as open or as closed as you want. What we recognize is, is that for each of the open source products that we're working with, and there are a number of them as well as open ones, there needs to be some sort of central body that represents the requirement of each of the trusts and, and the clinicians that are using those products. Now we term these as um, custodians custodians of the code. So in a normal circumstance, the code is open by the proprietary vendor. But in the case of open source, you need somebody who's going to be the sort of nominal owner of that on behalf of that community, those people that are participating and using it. That's what we call the custodian. And in, in the approach that we're taking, the custodian will then commission some services that are on behalf of the whole of that community. So those will be things like managing the code control, doing some testing, creating some of the creating the clinical engagement groups that will help drive the ongoing development of the product. It's been mentioned a few times today already that um, uh, we've both got a new one people talking about forking off. But forking off is one of the biggest problems that we get with open source because you start to um, disaggregate the, the innovation that's come in and been put into one central product and it starts getting split and the value just starts to drop. So, this isn't to say that by going open source we want to prevent people from doing that. People can do that and, and there's every reason why people may occasionally need to do that. But fundamentally it's in everyone's interest, especially within the IHS community, for us to collaborate and keep that together through the custodian. So that's one of the jobs that I will do in terms of uh, trying to establish those, create the frameworks which those will work and get them established. So we've got, as I talked about the, the tech fund, we know of probably over, well, well, well um, not know the exact numbers, but there's, there's between 10 and 15 who are actively interested in bidding on um, open eyes, which is part of organisations. We've got four or five interested in one other large PR provider, all here today from IMS. You have obviously seen a lot of the press around IMS offering to uh, give their product open source. So we, we're actively working with them. Um, we've also got another large EPR provider working with us at the moment around doing that as well. For each of those communities, we will be delivering, supporting them to deliver the custodianship services at that community interest around it. We're absolutely keen on continuing to build on this. And every week, we get approached by somebody else who's actually already built something in the NHS and now wants to share it and think what open source might be for them. Or alternatively, a, a sort of commercial proprietary vendor who's thinking actually this this model might work for us. This model, model might provide a different route to market, a more successful route to market. It might make our product better and more useful for people <coughs> as well. So we're still building that community of providers and products, and, and that's what we will be sharing through the community of interest, publishing those products, what they do, and that's sort of part of a bigger, wider piece, which also includes publicising the market of proprietary vendors. And at the moment, most of the things we've been doing have been in the acute space, but over time, we're really interested to work across all areas of, of health, all the way through to integration into social care as well. Just really quickly to give you a, a bit of a sense of where we are with the Full Trust Intelligence, hopefully compliments you all. Um, the, uh, this signifies the, the number of trusts that are involved and engaged with us around the tech fund at the moment. These are the active people who we think are going to put in bid for the tech fund. I'm not going to go through them all, but it just gives you a sense of the size and scale of people looking at putting these sort of products in. Um, <coughs> similar slide, and, and some of these actually will be putting on, on that community of interest that I talked about. Uh, the team here today has got the details to show you, give you the web address for all, and I think it's going to be on the slide at the end. This is just showing you a little bit around where the providers of the software are based at the moment. It doesn't include all of them, but it's just a, a bit of a sense. A lot of them are UK based. We also have some people international who are talking to us about open source products as well. Quick screenshot of the community of practice. 